Good afternoon. <clears throat> Hello. We're, we're glad that you're here. We appreciate you coming by. Sarah and I are so excited to be here with you today. Pastor and, Kelly. And um, share please. just a little bit of our own journey, our own stories, and some things that we've learned along the way. I am Liz Dyer. I'm the founder of the Mama Bears organization. And this... <laughs> And this is Sarah Cunningham, and Sarah is the founder of Free Mom Hugs. Sarah and I have really similar stories. Um, they didn't happen at the same exact time, but they're very similar. We both come from very conservative, Christian, evangelical backgrounds, and we both have sons who came out to us as gay when they were young adults. And neither of us were affirming when our sons came out to us. And that meant that the beginning of our journey as a parent of an LGBTQ child was kind of bumpy and there were some difficulties. Sarah, what was that first year like after Parker came out to you and your family? The first year after Parker came out, um, I believe that my response to you in an email was pure hell. Um, I It was not a... a a good place in my home. Um, when Parker came out of his closet, I went into mine, and I went into a depression. I went to my bed, and I stayed there, and I told my family I had the flu, and it's like Rex, my husband, and our other son, Travis, everyone kind of, everyone knew why I was in bed, and the, it was a, a vicious cycle because I knew I was there because I, I didn't know how to uh, respond like I should have and Parker knew that he couldn't change so it was a vicious cycle I felt bad for him because here I was feeling bad and you get the idea and so uh, but it was a journey like I I thought I was the only mom in Oklahoma with a gay kid um, with these crazy thoughts in my head that Parker was gonna go to hell for being gay and burn for eternity in the depths of hell forever and ever and that um, if he crossed the line of same sex, that that was beyond forgiveness from God. Like that was the ultimate sin. And it's like, I really thought I was the only mother in the world and I was frozen in that fear and anxiety and I didn't know where to look for resources. Um, I needed someone, I needed to hear from someone who shared my faith that it's all right to search the matter out. And um, when, like I said, when he came out of his closet, I went into mine and I had to re-examine everything that I believed. Why, what do I believe and why do I believe it? And so it was a journey. It was a very difficult time in my home, um, one that I regret greatly putting my family through. Yeah, I can relate to so many feelings um, that you mentioned, uh, feeling alone and and fearful, what does this mean for my son? What does it mean for our family? What should I be believing? Um, questioning what I did believe. I did do a lot of searching. And I think it, you always say, Sarah, that no one searches the heart of God or scripture more than an LGBTQ Christian or their mother. And um, I did that kind of searching because, you know, we wanted to do the right thing for our son. We wanted to, you know, give good advice, good guidance. We wanted to be good parents. But we had been taught that being gay was wrong, that it was harmful, uh, it wasn't in God's will. And I didn't know where to turn either. I felt very alone. But... I got lucky, and along the way, I connected with some progressive Christians. Uh, many of them are here at Wild Goose today, and they were able to help me explore other perspectives and ideas. I think the thing that helped me the most in my journey was as I began to meet more and more LGBTQ Christians, I became very aware that those LGBTQ people who were sincerely trying to embrace non-affirming theology, they were being harmed. They were experiencing a lot of depression and anxiety, self-loathing, 
uh, suicidal ideation. They had stories of uh, attempting to take their life. They knew friends who had tried, some who had succeeded. And I had always been a believer that good theology should produce some good fruit. And I couldn't find any good fruit that was being produced by non-affirming theology. And that began to give me the peace of mind and the peace of heart for me to really open up and without prejudice and without preconceived ideas to really explore this subject and this idea and figure out, you know, what it was I believed and why I believed it and, and what I should be doing in the midst of this circumstance. What was it that helped you the most? Because changing our mind like that, it's a, it's a big deal. We, we're completely changing what we believed, our perspective, what we thought. What helped you change your perspective and beliefs? You. <laughs> Short answer, we can all go home, Liz. Um, well, like you, you know, we thought we were the only people in the world with these crazy ideas in our head. Um, I went to the bookstore looking for faith-based resources, and uh, the resources that I did find were not helpful at all. And um, so I started writing about uh, my journey in the book, uh, How We Sleep at Night, a mother's memoir. I just wrote it for myself, never intending for it to go further. And um, am I getting ahead of you? That's okay. Sorry. Look, li okay, let's just be real. Liz. Cue card. No, I love it. I love this about Liz. She's so organized and put together and beautiful. And these are my notes. <laughs> but I, I We make like a good team. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, during the time that Parker was, was uh, after he came out, uh, it was a, during a time where all the world's attention was on the, the gay Christian debate. Uh, the Chick-fil-A debate, the bathroom debate, and all of those things. And I felt like every time I heard um, a comment in the workplace or that it was about Parker. And I thought, that's not my son at all. Nothing bad happened to him. Um, Rex and I did the very best that we could. And Parker knew scripture. He knew the Lord. And so everything that, that I was hearing did not... Um, um, did not describe my son. So I knew that that was my first red flag, if you will. And then when I saw Parker, when he did come out, guess what? He was happy. He was living authentically. He had some good friends. And it was seeing him live authentically, then meeting his friends and hearing stories about how they had been alienated. And then when the book came out, I found your, your group, and I don't want to get ahead of you, but it was Liz. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that really describes what so many of us um, go through. It's not a one-moment thing. It is a journey. It is a process. There are many elements that play into it. And I think you really hit on something really important is when we see the difference in our children once they come out and they start living as their true self and... Um, just seeing the difference that it makes in them and, and the way that they carry themselves and the look on their face and, and all those little things that, as moms, we really do notice. You know, they make a difference to us. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we were wanting to mention, and you kind of touched on that, what made you write your book, and then that led to your organization, and what made me start... Um, my Facebook group. Initially, I started blogging a little bit. Um, people were sending parents to me who had kids who were coming out, and I was offering the same resources and stories over and over again, so it seemed um, to make sense to put them on a blog where we could refer people. And a lot of conversations at that time, this was back in 2007, 2008, a lot of online conversations were taking place in the comment section of blogs. And so I started blogging. And then around 2013, there were some groups that started popping up on Facebook for parents of LGBTQ kids. And I felt I'd made a lot of connections and I wanted to share those with others. I wanted to keep making connections with families with LGBTQ kids and I wanted to give away for uh, those families to make connections and find resources. So that was the beginning and that's why 
You said that you started your book mostly because it was just cathartic for yourself? Yes, it was mostly for myself because I didn't know what to do with those feelings. They were new to me. Even saying words like homosexuality sounded so foreign coming out of my mouth. And never mind about the acronym LGBTQIA2 Spirit Plus and Beyond, which I love and respect so much. But it was about, and I'd never written anything before. I have a 10th grade education. Um, you realize how limited your vocabulary is at that point. But uh, I wrote it for myself and thinking, well, maybe I'll just share it if I, by, by then I'm meeting other parents, but no intention of, you know, it, selling it by any means or having it available online. And what's the name of your book? How We Sleep at Night, Another, um, Another's Mem A Mother's how, Memoir. How We Sleep at Night, A Mother's Memoir. So you can get that on Amazon? Yeah, you can get it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Um, but it's, um, it's a book about just how we got from the church to the Pride Festival without losing my faith, without losing my son, and the people that we met along the way. And the last chapter was inspired by standing at the Pride Festival with Parker and my husband. And it was my first intentional interaction with the gay community. And I fell in love with this beautiful, spirit-filled community. And I went there looking for the Lord's favor. I didn't understand pride. I didn't understand the pride flag. I didn't understand about a little gay bar in New York City called the Stonewall Inn. It didn't mean anything to me until I had skin in the game. And uh, it was a, uh, an experience that were pivotal in the life of my family. And uh, shortly thereafter, I found an article in the newspaper, and it led me to your group. There are about 250 members in the group. And it was there. I remember one of the first comments was from a mother, and she goes, I just heard the words, Mom, I'm gay. And I don't even know how to pray. I don't even know how to breathe right now. And that thread, you know how a thread will just blow up, and another, all the other moms in that group said, then you don't. You let us breathe, and you let us pray for you. And that was my first picture of support. And we were able to just pour in all of our anxieties and our fears into that group without ha having it in our homes or with our, in our children, on our children. That's not their burden, right? So, and I found resources, faith-based resources, and other moms. Um, and guess what? We all had the same story of feeling alienated from our churches, from our families, because as we became educated on things like the history of human sexuality and on science and evidence and hearing testimonies from gay Christians, as we became more affirming and accountable to laws that affect our children and our family, we learn, we find our voice and we start changing the conversation at the water cooler we start finding out about laws that affect our families and our children, and you begin to celebrate your child. And as that happens, you alienate yourself from those people who were where you were. Yeah, and I mean, Sarah and I really always are like amazed at how similar our stories are but also how many families we meet that have similar stories. And I think the things that we see the most common among families like ours is a desire to make connections with other families that get it, that are like-minded, to find good resources, and also to that have a dream of a world that is kinder and safer and more loving for all LGBTQ people to live and thrive. And Sarah and I both had a dream, and we were fortunate enough um, for that dream to really take off. I uh, started this Facebook group for moms of LGBTQ kids in 2014 with, I don't know, a couple hundred moms or less. And today we have almost 30,000 moms in that one group. And I kind of had... Um, I wanted to offer connections and I wanted to offer support, but I also had this little secret dream that these moms would help me change the world. And they are helping me change the world. And, and I'm helping them change the world because what I think we've all discovered is what happens in the family is gonna spill over 
It's going to spill over to the churches and the schools and the communities and the neighborhoods and the politics. And things are going to get changed. Not as fast as we'd like. There's still a lot of work to do. But we're in that work and we're excited about it. And I don't think we could have ever dreamed that things would grow this much. I mean, in addition to that one group, we have more than 60 regional groups that make it easier for our members to get together in person. We have seven special projects that serve the LGBTQ community. We make blankets, show up at weddings, chat, send you know gifts in the mail, different things like that. And um, we're always learning. We're always learning from each other. And I think that's really important. Sarah went out and made a homemade button and wore it at the Pride Parade that said Free Mom Hugs. And that's what sparked what she's got going on. Tell us a little bit about Free Mom Hugs. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not the first mom to offer hugs at a Pride Festival. Um, but after standing at the Pride Parade with my son in that first year, I got plugged into the community. And I started volunteering for the Pride Board, uh, helping out with PFLAG, um, meeting the transgender community there and hearing their stories. And so the next year, I made a homemade button that said free mom hugs, and with anyone who made eye contact with me, I would say, can I offer you a free mom hug? And the first uh, young woman that I gave a hug to said it had been four years since she got a hug from her mother because she's a lesbian. And it was that moment that I knew that spark was there, and that from that experience, we started Free Mom Hugs. And now we have chapters in every state, and we have some mama bears here today. Uh, but really, I, can I just add this? When we, we had a post that went viral, and people wanted to form chapters where they were, but we went to Liz's group to get those mama bears to start the groups. I couldn't imagine doing it any other way, because we knew that they had skin in the game. And so we had mama beers in states starting chapters. And the only requirement is that you're fully affirming. That means that you celebrate the gay community and same-sex marriage is holy. That's it. And then to show up at a pride festival. But so many times it goes beyond that. Pretty soon you start helping out at PFLAG. Pretty soon you start planning a transgender Valentine's banquet. And before you know it, you're changing the world. Liz says, moms learn from other moms. And it's true. I always thought the bridge would be between the church and the gay community. And I tried that. So many different projects. It was crazy. But now I do believe that what she says is true. It starts in the home. And it's going to start with families and then it's going to spill over. So I'm really, honestly, that's something to get excited about because that's, that's seeable. That's doable. So what was the question? <laughs> you did it. You did it. Okay, so we're doing great. One thing that we promised uh, today is that we would share some things that we've learned along the way. Like I said, we're always learning. We're always learning from each other. We're always learning from the community that we serve. And we are always learning from our LGBTQ children too. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Sarah, what are some things that you've learned about being a supportive parent? of an LGBTQ child. What, what is it that you would tell other parents that you've learned that's really important and would help, has helped you and would help them? I would say being a parent of an LGBTQ plus child is first of all, allow the child to show you who they are and that just allows space. And sometimes it's a vocabulary to express, to have a conversation like that. Um, sometimes it's watching shows that include same-sex couples and not changing the channel. Sometimes it's wearing a rainbow button or going to a pride festival with a free mom hug shirt. You get the idea. So you set the stage before um, you rather have it than not need it than have you get it. Um, and that um, accepting to surround yourself with people who look different than you do. If you look around your church or your place of worship and you see people that look just like you do, we need to get out and surround ourselves with people who uh, look different than us. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, I think it's really important for families to find support, like you said, away from your LGBTQ kid. You don't want to depend on them to be the one to educate you 
or to carry your worries or fears. Um, so getting together with other parents, going to PFLAG meetings, maybe there's an affirming church near you that has a group that meets. Um, find a way to connect with other families like yours and, and get support and, and you know get insight and wisdom from people who maybe are ahead of you in the journey. Uh, I really want to emphasize what you've said about uh, giving your kids room to be themselves. I think that's so important. One of the common questions that I get from families is, is my kid too young or is this just a phase? Well, my, my response is listen and believe your child. Your child has probably thought about this more than you can imagine before bringing it up to you. And really with sexual orientation, there's no set age. It's, it's different. Some people know very young who they're attracted to. For some people, it's something they discover later in life. For gender identity, uh, young children as long, young as two years old, usually between two to five years old, is going. they're gonna recognize and identify gender and start to understand their own gender. The thing with gender identity with really young children is you can look for consistence, insistence, and persistence. But really, if it's a phase, what's the big deal if you supported your kid? You know, what's the big deal if you were affirming of the sexual orientation that they told you they were or the gender identity? What's the big deal if you let a young person socially transition and you use a different name and different pronouns and, and let them present as the gender identity that they believe they are? The big deal would be if it's not a phase and you didn't support them. Then you could do some real harm. So the bottom line really is just to emphasize, listen and believe your child, give them space, and do what you can to show them that you support them. Mm -hmm. And that. find support for yourself. Good job, Liz. Sarah, another thing that you and I often hear is that families are very concerned and worried um, about how non-affirming friends and family members are going to treat their LGBTQ child and their family. You know, what's gonna be the fallout from that? What advice would you give families when it comes to dealing with non-affirming friends and family members? When dealing with non-affirming friends and family, I think first and foremost you need to, um, again, like Liz said, surround yourself with people who support and celebrate you and your, your child, your family, and um, to equip yourself with an answer. And by that means, I mean get educated on things like gender identity and sexual orientation. I had no idea that was even a thing. No idea. Gender identity, uh, do you feel like a boy? Do you feel like a girl? Do you feel like both? Do you feel like neither one? And that's okay. Who knew? Or uh, sexual orientation, who do you want to spend time with? I didn't have that concept in my head. I, would, I wish I would have taught that, had that knowledge to teach it to my child so it wouldn't be foreign to them. So the more education you have for yourself, for your child, the more confidence they're gonna have to be able to stand their ground and have peace within themselves and prepare themselves with an answer, even if it is to themselves. So education is the key to this. I think that's it. Yeah, no, I agree. Once you feel like you have uh, some knowledge, then you're more confident to you know, face these difficult relationships or conversations. I would also say to parents of LGBTQ kids, it's not your job. You can if you want to, but it's not your job to educate other people. It's not your job to change someone's mind. We can't change anyone's mind. Um, if someone is open and wants to have a conversation, that is great. But if they're not, then maybe the best thing you can do is sit down with your family and come up with some healthy boundaries rather than try to take on this burden of trying to change someone else's mind. Uh, I love um, something that Glennon uh, Doyle shared. She talked about 
when she came out as um, gay and she got married to a woman that, you know, being a public figure especially, there was a lot of pushback from certain groups of people. And her own mother, even though she was supportive, she was worried and fearful. And Glennon had children too, and she made the decision that she didn't want her mother to come to their house while she was fearful and worried and trying to work this out. And she kind of put it back on her mom. I love you, but this is your problem. I can't fix this for you. You have to go and do your own study, your own research, and come up with your own answers. And if you get to a place where you are really okay and you're not fearful and you're not hesitant and you don't have doubts, then come here to our home. But we don't want to expose what we've built here to that kind of fear, to that kind of uh, questioning and doubting. And so she came up with her own healthy boundaries. And I think that's really something that a lot of parents skip that step when they're worried about dealing with non-affirming friends and family. Decide ahead of time, because it's really important that you protect your kid. And you have to, you know your child, you know what's gonna be good for them, you know your family, you make those decisions for yourself. And just remember, it's great to have the information, but that's mostly for your own sake. You don't have to be the person to educate other people. There are resources out there, anybody can use Google. She also says you're a goddamn cheetah. <laughs> I have to remind not, myself of that. Not me, Glennon Doyle said that. Uh, <laughs> it's true. I always say when you get together to hear uh, Sarah speak, two things are going to happen. You're going to laugh and you're probably going to cry. So watch it. She's probably going to make you cry before it's over here. Okay, our time is almost up. Oh Let's end up with a few tips for LGBTQ allies. I'm so ready for this. Things I've learned along the way being an ally. Never ask for testosterone or hormone replacement on social media for your transgender friends. Don't do that. You'll get in trouble. <laughs> I did that. I had a transgender friend who, um, through a series of, of unfortunate events, became homeless. And it was a, a beautiful, it is a trend, my beautiful friend Solo, he's a transgender male, and he wasn't able to keep up with his medicine. And I loved him so when he was desperate, I was desperate, so I put a shout out on social media. Anyway, all that to say, don't do that. And, <laughs> But I think uh, just learn, educate yourself, know that you're, as an ally, just show up and learn and ask questions and uh, just pour into this community and know that you're in, you're in their space that, I don't know, there's times when I just feel like I've been, I've been accepted, I've been uh, invited into just a very special, almost sacred space with beautiful people and it's just a sense of belonging and community. I thought I knew about community in, the, in, my, in my church, but I've learned so much more. And being an ally is just about showing up and being present, being visible. And then as you get educated to start being vocal and where you can speak on behalf of your gay friends and family, do that. When you can offer them a platform to do it, do that. And... Um, tithe to organizations who are helping families like Liz Dyer's group, um, free mom hugs or whatever it is who's doing the work, pour into that because there are so many big things happening in the world, but guess what? It doesn't change what's happening in the LGBTQ plus community and the challenges that they face and that allies doing the work. So um, ally means just showing up and being available. Definitely. Show up, speak up, be visible. Um, what can I add to that? Uh, let's see if I had anything else. Oh, you got something. <laughs> well, um, listen and pay close attention to LGBTQ people. Um, they are the ones that are going to tell us what they need and what they want and what they desire. If you 
you know, don't feel like you have enough LGBTQ people in your life. There's always social media. There's lots of news articles. Lots of people are sharing their stories. There's some good uh, movies and uh, TV series out. Find ways to really listen closely and listen with compassion and without judgment. And, um, you know, just be willing to say, oh, I get that now and I had it wrong. Because being an ally can sometimes be a little uncomfortable because we're going to make mistakes and people are going to correct us. And that's okay. We want that because we want to be good allies. And I always say being an ally is, you know, kind of like being a parent. It's, it's not for the faint hearted. You know, you got to be a little tough. You got to be willing to get your feelings hurt sometimes. You got to be willing to make mistakes and admit it and then do something different. I also think we need to, as LGBTQ allies, really try to be a role model for kindness and inclusion in all of our relationships. I don't think that means that we don't speak up when someone is saying or doing something harmful. If we hear or see homophobia or transphobia or biphobia, I think as an ally, we have to speak up. We don't have to be mean-spirited about it. We can even speak up in a way that we assume the other person did not mean to harm. But we need to speak up. And like Sarah said earlier, one of the best ways to plan to do that is to have a few responses in your back pocket. Know ahead of time what you're gonna say. Maybe you like using humor. Maybe you like using a story. Maybe you want to use statistics and studies. Whatever it is that works for you and your personality style, have a few things in your back pocket. And I always like to start out with, I know you probably didn't intend blah, 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 but that is actually harmful and is considered homophobic. Homophobia does not mean that people are, it doesn't just mean you're afraid of LGBTQ people. It also means you have, you know, a kind of a disgust or a negative attitude towards LGBTQ people. So be a role model for kindness and inclusion and, um, you know, be civil but informative. Can I add something to that real quick? Yeah, go. That about being an ally is prior to Parker coming out, I was the least politically minded person you will ever meet. I had no idea that my straight son has more rights than my gay son. I had no idea that Tr Parker, my gay son, could be refused health care, uh, housing, even refused and, and service in a public space, even today. And those are laws that affect my child. So it's being an advocate not only in the community, within the community, but within the law and knowing, being knowledgeable about the laws that are, are affecting our children and uh, speaking up about those things. Yeah, we've even noticed a trend uh, among families with LGBTQ kids. Uh, when we first started this work, Sarah and I, we, there were a lot more conversations with parents struggling to reconcile their faith with being affirming of their kids. And those conversations do still take place, but a lot less. Now parents of LGBTQ kids are mostly concerned about what rights and protections do my kids have? Is that school gonna be safe? How do I find out if that church is fully inclusive and affirming of my LGBTQ kid? These are the questions that parents are asking today more than ever. And so I think we've done a good job um, collectively getting some information out there about how important it is to be affirming and that even though there are still people really hanging on to clobber verses, that, you know, those things are losing a lot of power and a lot of momentum. So things are changing. Let's ask some questions. You want? Yep. Or, or allow some questions to be asked. I apologize. Any questions? Yeah, it's true. Um, all family members aren't on the same page at the same time. And I have found that it's probably best if people aren't on the same page for each person to find their own space to process. Maybe, um, you know, their own small group or their own online community. 
because we can tend to want to be too much help to each other sometimes. <laughs> so if someone is, you know, doing it a little different than I would, um, if they're going a little slower or a little faster, I need to let them process at their own pace. I think the most important thing for families is while they're going through the process to agree that the number one thing they must do is show their child wholehearted support and affirmation and celebration. Because what we know is that otherwise we could be putting these children at you know risk of you know harming their mental health and their physical well-being so i think you know you really have to push on that issue but as far as learning all the other stuff let people go at their own pace and encourage them to find someone a friend a group a community for them to do their own process i would only that add to that is how you react will have a ripple effect how I reacted to Parker had a ripple effect within my family. If I had handled that differently, it could have gone a whole new way. So how you react will have a ripple effect, whether it's uh, your uh, inner family or extended family. And the good news is there's a lot of resources out there nowadays for families. And if you go to freemomhugs.org or realmamabears.org, you will find a lot of resources that we have connected to. But, you know, there's also things like PFLAG and the Trevor Project and Human Rights Campaign that you may be familiar with. They also have great list of resources on their websites. Yep. Well, um, yeah, I, I would say that Southern Baptist and... Um, the Catholic Church. They are the largest denominations in our country and they are not affirming. I mean, I have to project and guess. Um, it's certainly speculation, but I'm assuming a lot of it has to do with money. <laughs> um, change is going to usually result in some loss and some things are gonna to have to get torn down before they can be rebuilt. And a lot of people have their careers and identities and purpose already wrapped up in these ideas and these communities and these cultures and they've spent a lot of time creating them and building them and it's dangerous for them there is some danger for them. They were going to have to lose something if they go in that direction. Our sons came out like 14 years ago. This was not a conversation that was really prevalent at that time. I really had not given it that much thought. I'm not sure that parents today can say that. I think there's enough in the news, in the media, uh, in art, in music. I don't think parents would be the, in the same situation. And I think that's why we are seeing less and less parents talk about this subject. What do you think, uh, Sarah? I mean, had you thought much about it before Parker came out? No. I, was a, I just knew at that time that I thought, why would God give me a gay kid? I was okay with people being gay until it was my son. So, um, but I think it's fear and ignorance with the very best, uh, with, respectfully, because I was there. Fear and ignorance. We know the power of fear and ignorance. We know the power of love and education. And, and kind of twofold to what your gentleman, your question was, we have to consider the demographics, the education, the, the geographics, where people grew up, what they had access to. Like Liz said, we're so f much further along than we were 10 years ago, as far as the information and just people talking about the subject. So demographics, education, what people have access to, um, and getting educated. It's scripture that's been misinterpreted, misunderstood, and misused, sometimes with really good intentions. Um, and just calling that out. Yeah, whether it's in a faith community or in a um, you know secular community, Education, I think, is the key to 
curing homophobia, transphobia, biphobia. I mean, if people are open to learning and growing, it becomes pretty evident. I mean, I know I'm living a little bit in a bubble, but I am really surprised that a denomination is going to split over this subject. And I think that's gonna happen, and, and it just surprises me. I, I just can't believe anybody wouldn't go along with this at this point. <laughs> I would have liked to hear um, that it's okay to search the matter out. And when you do, we're going to celebrate, or already celebrate, I don't know, but have uh, you know, things that represent the gay community in your fellowship. Have couples there, just anything that will send a message. But mostly it's okay to search the matter out. It doesn't have to be a difficult situation or conversation. Yeah, I really do like what you said, Sarah, because actually my pastor did say, yeah, God, God still loves Nick. And nobody at my church was saying that my son was going to go to hell. They were just saying, it's not going to go well for him if he doesn't do ABC. Or if he does ABC, it's not going to go well. He can't date someone of the same sex. He can't fall in love with someone the same sex. He can't get married to someone and expect life to be good and fruitful and expect to be whole and healthy. They never said he couldn't come to church. They never said he was a horrible person. They never said he was going to hell. But what they said did not bring me comfort. <laughs> it didn't bring me comfort to know that God loved him even though he was gay. I needed to know that God loved my son and celebrated him for who he was. I needed permission as a parent to love and celebrate my son wholeheartedly just as he was. And I didn't know to do that. I was afraid to do that. I was afraid it would be the wrong thing. I was afraid it would be the unloving thing. I wanted my son to be whole and healthy and you know, just like every parent. I wanted my son to have a chance to have a good life. And I had always believed that, be that living within God's will, doing things God's way, was the path to being healthy and whole. I didn't think it would solve everything immediately, but I thought it would, you know, head us in the right direction. So yeah, I would have liked to have heard that. It's hard for me to imagine my pastor at that time saying that because I knew what he believed and I know what he still believes. So how to open up a conversation for the parent, with a parent of an LGBTQ kid and that parent's kind of closed-minded or, no, I didn't hear you, got it. So someone who doesn't have an LGBTQ kid, but is not affirming, how to open up a conversation with them to help them move to an affirming position. But you said they were closed-minded, and I wanna say, <laughs> I'm not sure there is a way that's going to make a difference, because one thing I've really learned on this journey is I can't change anyone's mind. People have to change their own mind. And I, don't know what to do with someone who is not seeking the information. I can't make them comprehend it, accept it, respond to it in a positive way, have an open mind. They have to do that themselves. Um, my advice is really don't take that burden on yourself. Let, if they're interested, let them come to you and give resources. But I wouldn't try to push someone who's close-minded. I, I would say I love that. But I would also say make sure they know where you stand. And the more you normalize it, like, oh, hey, my friend and, and their partner coming over for dinner. Do you know they, you know, like to hike? Just make it just like anybody else, just like you would introduce anybody else. So make sure they know where you stand. That way they're not going to act like that around you. 
Okay, we're out of time. If we didn't get to answer a question that you would like to talk to us about it, we've got a mama bear den. It's just basically all the way across. We're right by the river. And we would love for you to stop by there. And um, we'd love to visit with you and get to know you. Thank you for being here today. We really appreciate the support. Thank you.